Well, thanks very much, Pam, and thanks everyone for coming along. Um, wow, so much information. Um, just a short plug for Hazel Brothers, um, Tasmanian based family company. Uh, we're involved in civil construction, quarrying, earth moving, concrete, industrial services. Lots of things that um, generate respirable crystalline silica. About 18 months ago, Hazel Brothers advertised for an environment manager, and my background's actually environmental stuff, and I thought, this is a job of a lifetime, and so I applied for it, and I was lucky enough to be, to be um, given the job. It wasn't till afterwards that I saw there was a line in the contract that uh, mentioned responsibility for health surveillance programs in the company, and I'd, I literally know nothing about it. Um, I do understand a little bit about a little bit about risk, though. I've spent most of my working life in forestry and manufacturing, transport, mining, and construction, and we'll all know that they're probably some of the most hazardous environments that you can work in. Um, I do cast my mind back to when I was a young child as well, and I used to do some gardening work for my mum and dad uh, to earn pocket money, and as a young child I was constantly being reminded to put things away. One day there was a rake lying on the ground, and with the benefit of hindsight, um, I probably should have recognised that that was a hazard, something that had the potential to cause harm. Um, nowadays, I prob probably would have looked at the risk that that hazard presented and realised that it was almost certain that I was going to tread on that rake at one point in time, and sure enough, I did. Not all hazards are as evident as a rake handle between the eyes. Occupational hygiene hazards, as I like to refer to them, are like that. They can present immediate or long-term risks to a person's health. And these occupational hygiene hazards include noise, asbestos, lead, dust and hazardous chemicals. And hazardous chemicals include respirable crystalline silica. Why is it important to monitor to monitor people's health when they're exposed to these hazards. Well, it's important to look after people's health. And as a PCBU, a person in charge of a business or undertaking, we have a primary duty of care under the Workplace Health and Safety Act to do that. This duty includes identifying hazards and managing risks to health and safety. And occupational hygiene hazards are subject to regulatory health monitoring requirements, and we need to be mindful of those. Those requirements apply generally to workers who are exposed to a hazard and are frequently required to wear PPE in order to minimise those exposure risks. And I say generally because if you work in the asbestos industry or if you work in the lead industry, then you'll know that you don't have any choice to monitor your people's health. Uh, it's a mandatory requirement. But when it comes to things like hazardous chemicals, it comes down to risk. So the regulations state that workers frequently required to wear PPE to minimise exposure risks should be subject to health monitoring. What does that mean? What is frequently and to how often and to who should that health monitoring apply? So Hazel Brothers has been conducting occupational hygiene surveys and Richard stood up and talked about those for many, many years. And we've also been conducting personal health monitoring for dust and also noise. They're the main things we've been looking at. 
But it's probably fair to say that the process hasn't been as well coordinated as it should be or could be, um, and it's been somewhat limited in scope. Typically, we've had people come into the business, um, start to tackle some of these issues, and then they've moved out and the whole thing's died. Um, so the challenge for me that I was set was to develop a risk-based health monitoring procedure that could inform managers and assist in targeting high-risk sites and exposed workers. And uh, I'd, fair to say, I really didn't appreciate what that involved, and I was pretty naive, and I'm a little bit wiser now as to what's required. The other thing um, I've found is that a lot of people are struggling with these same types of issues. How do we implement a health monitoring procedure for our company? Who was exposed to these occupational hygiene risks and at what level? Um, these are all issues that we need to be mindful of. And um, what I'm going to share today is just a bit of a, um, a model of how it can be done, how I went about doing it with the assistance of my colleagues, and it might work for you. Um, I hate to say this, but if you want to get on top of this issue, you really need to understand the legal and other requirements around health monitoring. Um, there's lots of them. And the best place to start is the Workplace Health and Safety Act and regulations. It's uh, incredibly boring reading, um, but it is really the best place to start to understand what your obligations are. <clears throat> SWA or Safe Work Australia Codes of Practice, Model Codes of Practice and Guidelines, they're really helpful. Um, they provide guidance on how you can meet your obligations under the Act and regulations. And there's lots and lots of stuff there around health monitoring and there's an increasing amount of information available on respirable crystalline silica. Um, so having read all the relevant legal and other requirements, um, weeks of my life that I'll never get back, um, I then started to review all the occupational hygiene surveys that have been completed by Hazel Brothers over the years, and this probably goes back about 10 or more years, um, trying to understand were there actual occupational hygiene risks that we should be mindful of, and to what level were, exposed, were workers exposed to? and how did that relate to the exposure standards that were in place. I used all of that information to prepare a series of risk assessments for the company. Um, it's really pleasing for me to stand or to listen today to some of the speakers and hear a lot about risk and how we should understand what the risk is for the whole range of workers who are working on a site because typically what we used to do was we'd rig people up with the personal exposure monitors and they were our frontline uh, plant operators um, and we'd get some information back and then we'd try and interpret that um, as to what it meant in terms of meeting our legal and other requirements. But what we forgot about were there's, was that there's a whole bunch of other people on site, people working in offices, at Weybridges, um, managers getting around, uh, checking on things. And we tended to neglect those people and we didn't really understand what the risk was for those people and, and we found that they were concerned about what their level of exposure was and we were totally neglecting them. So it was pleasing to hear um, somebody said today that we should be looking at the whole range of workers and the exposure risks. Um, the risk assessments that we completed identified the sites in the work groups for ongoing occupational hygiene surveys, as well as those workers who should be subject to periodic health monitoring. Because what we found is that some sites the risk was very low and other sites the risk was actually getting close to the exposure standard. And some people in some roles had a very low risk and other people, sometimes people we didn't anticipate, were actually getting close to the recommended exposure standards. So the risk assessments and the occupational hygiene surveys 
provided some really interesting results. Um, the risk-based approach means that resources for health monitoring programs can be targeted towards those sites and to those workers where they are most needed. Because if you're running a health monitoring program or doing occupational hygiene surveys for, the, for your businesses, then you'll understand that those services do not come cheap and we need to direct those resources to where they are most needed. And the best way to do that is using a risk-based approach. There's a health surveillance risk assessment. Um, there's nothing exceptional about these. We've probably done dozens, if not hundreds of these things, but we're looking at, for this site, a mobile heavy equipment operator. We just identified the hazards, respirable crystalline silica, respirable dust, not otherwise specified noise, diesel particulates, asbestos, inherent risk score, listed the risk control measures that we have in place and then came up with a residual risk score. And some were medium, uh, other roles were quite, uh, other areas were quite low and we're using this to inform ongoing personal health surveillance and ongoing occupational hygiene surveys. Um, of course, the reason for doing all this was to come up with a health monitoring procedure. Um, and this was just basically a guideline for the people who worked in the company how to get through the minefield that um, is regulatory health monitoring. It is really hard going. Um, and it's pretty straightforward, the procedure we came up with, just a few definitions for average garden variety people who don't really understand the terminology. Uh, links to the legal and other requirements, so you can just click on something, you don't have to wade through the WorkSafe website. Pre-employment medicals, occupational hygiene surveys, noise and audiometric testing, hazardous chemicals, lead, asbestos, general health monitoring duties, and the risk assessments. Um, Pre-employment medicals, I'll touch on these. Uh, they're standard pr practice at Hazel Brothers. Um, they talk about workers' previous exposure to occupational hygiene hazards, noise, asbestos, hazardous chemicals, including respirable crystalline silica. Um, they include audiometry and lung function tests as a standard, and they provide invaluable baseline data on which health, later health monitoring can be compared. Um, Occupational hygiene surveys. Uh, these are assessments of aimed at identifying the presence of a hazard um, in the workplace, essentially. Um, and the risk assessments identified knowledge gaps that have informed the scope of future surveys, additional work sites, work groups, and survey frequencies. So we've used those risk assessments in that way. Surveys typically are static monitoring devices or personal health monitors, and we saw a little bit about those previously. Um, and the survey results we use to update the risk assessments um, so that we can better understand occupational hygiene risks. Noise and audiometric testing, I'll just touch briefly on this. Many of our workers are exposed to noise in the workplace um, and as a PCBU we are required to ensure that the exposure doesn't exceed the regulatory workplace noise exposure standard. Um, where there's a risk the exposure standard will be exceeded, the worker must be wearing hearing protection PPE. And if you've got to wear hearing protection PPE, then the PCB, PCBU must provide audiometric testing. And audiometric testing must be conducted every two years. Hazardous chemicals, there's over 700 of them, Schedule, uh, schedule 14 in the regulations. Um, exposure mostly occurs due to inhalation of dust, fumes or gases. Um, and exposure can result in immediate, acute or long-term chronic effects. We've already heard about those. And respirable crystalline silica is a hazardous chemical. Um, regulatory health monitoring for respirable crystalline silica includes the standard lung function test um, and chest x-rays where workers are exposed to the hazard. And Safe Work Australia recommends health monitoring be conducted before exposure, during work-related activities, and if a worker expresses concern about exposure and also at termination of work-related activities. Lead, um, anyone work in lead here? Yes, I know some do. 
Um, you will certainly know it if you do because um, the, the uh, regulations are quite strict. Um, apply to females of reproductive capacity and all others. Um, exposure standards are stringent and they set the titan. Again, normally we're, where we work in lead process sites, um, we govern by the uh, client procedures and they include baseline biological testing. Um, you feel a bit like a pin cushion if you've worked in a lead environment. Um, asbestos, uh, if, if you work, in, if you do undertaking licensed asbestos work, you've really got no choice. You need to undertake health surveillance. Um, the PCP, PCBU must ensure health monitoring commences before the worker carries out the licensed asbestos removal work. And health monitoring would usually be in the form of spirometry or lung function tests and chest x-rays where workers are exposure risk. So in summary, just be aware that there are legal and other requirements around occupational hygiene hazards and health monitoring. Um, the procedure that we've developed in Hazel Brothers, it doesn't change any of these obligations and it can't. Um, what it really tries to do is um, provide um, a concise single document where people can go to where people can go to to try and understand what their obligations are. The legal and other requirements are linked um, if you need to um, look at further information. Um, and the procedure is informed by a series of risk assessments which provide guidance on the frequency of occupational hygiene surveys, surveys that we undertake and also personal health monitoring. And the key benefit for Hazel Brothers is that that ensures that any resources that are available for health surveillance and ongoing personal health monitoring are spent wisely and put to where they need to be put. That's it. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so that was a, a great example of how with this Better Work TAS program we have companies that are prepared and happy to share what they're doing in the different spaces of work health and safety. Um, and thanks very much for that, Chris. Any quick questions?